So, I don't know about what your dreams are all about, but everyone needs to have a dream. If you're going through life without a dream, you have a flat tire. Now, sometimes, though, it's hard to tap into these dreams. It's hard to try to figure out how to make them happen. This guy not only had a dream, made his dream come true, now he's helping other people figure it out. Gary Vaynerchuk... Uh, not born in the United States, but came over and started with very little to work with and has everything to work with now. And now he wants to make sure we have the same opportunities. We are so excited to have him here. Just talking about him coming in today has caused quite a, a storm. And he's a local guy, too. So he's going to he's gonna have a little uh, great New Jersey energy for you. Please welcome to the show, Gary V. <laughs> there he is. Hi. Elvis, nice to meet you. Such a pleasure. Come on in. Don't 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 mind the dog. I'm I'm thrilled with the dog. Okay. Well, Hi, gang. Hi, good morning. Look, oh, there's your first wisdom you? of the day. I'm thrilled with the dog. Right. Hope you're writing down. all these down. I am. Do I have to put these on? No. Yeah. Yes. No, great. No. I mean, if we take well, a yeah. phone call. I'll take it. Okay. Well, you can like do what you want to do. So wait a minute, wait a minute, real quick, just to set the tone. You have a gold mic and everybody else doesn't? Yes. yes. <laughs> it's, it's, a dynamic. it's Elvis Duran and the morning show. Yeah. I'm, I'm the pompous ass. <laughs> well, pleasure. you know what it is? Well, I'm excited you. to be here. Gary, uh, first of all, uh, Charlemagne is a very dear friend of ours. And yes. he just, when he found out you were going to be on the show, he's like, you're going to love Gary V. He's great. We, we we had a lot of fun together, and he's a, a really sharp dude. Yeah, he's wonderful. He is. And he's off on his own and doing so well with so many different things, and he gives you a lot of credit. That's super nice. But uh, but I think his hustle and his ambition has a, a lot to do with that. But I'll take any uh, any credit I don't deserve any day of the week. Let me let me just uh, start up the, the lawnmower real quick here. Yes. And you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Then I want to move on to some other things. Go ahead. Uh, Gary, uh, born and raised uh, in... Born in Belarus in the former Soviet Union. And raised in New Jersey. Raised in New Jersey. First came over to Queens, lived there for two years, and then mainly grew up in Edison, New Jersey. Your uh, parents, your father had a wine store. Yes, my dad came here with 100 bucks lived the American dream, eventually became a stock boy, manager, and then eventually uh, bought a store in Clark, New Jersey, mm -hmm. called Shoppers Discount Liquors, and then opened a store in Springfield, New Jersey. <clears throat> I was a, you know, entrepreneur, lemonade stand, baseball card shows in Phillipsburg Mall, Bridgewater Mall. Like, it, it's fun to do this show, obviously, a lot of locals. And then, and then eventually my dad dragged me into the store, and, uh, I revolutionized the wine industry by launching one of the first e-commerce wine businesses called winelibrary.com and built up one of the biggest wine shops in America over in Milburn, Springfield, Short Hills, New Jersey. Even those who, who don't know a lot about wine, which is most of us, you can watch Gary in the old days when he was doing these videos, when he's doing these... Uh, uh, wine Library TV. Wine, wine Lab TV show. It's like a normal, average guy trying wine without going, oh, it's got the undertones and overtones <laughs> of, you know, socks. You would drink wine and go, yeah, this is good. And we'd, we'd buy it. Elvis, that was a big thing. So YouTube came out. So I was right about e-commerce. I was right about Google AdWords. I was right about email marketing. And then YouTube comes out. And I'm like, this is going to be big. And so four months after YouTube started, in 2006, I started Wine Library TV. And, and everybody who's listening right now, it, you know, just think to yourself, do you know somebody that's into wine? And I think most people are going to say yes. And what everybody knows is that the second somebody just gets a little bit of wine knowledge, they become a straight jerk. Yeah, right? it's true. Right? Yeah. You're like, oh, you're drinking the wrong year, right? Or you didn't <laughs> smell that properly. And I was a Jersey kid that came from not a whole lot, but I knew an obnoxious amount about wine because I grew up in the business. So when right. I started Wine Library TV, I just referred to wines the way I grew up. Like, this smells like a Hulk Hogan wrestling figure, or this is like a racquetball, <laughs> right. or this is like, you know, big league... Ch for example, a lot of Cabernets smell like Big League Chew. Oh, I love Big League Chew. <laughs> <laughs> you love Big League Chew? But you made wine fun and approachable. And now wine, because of you, a lot of people give you credit, wine has become a major, major business for all of us to I think, enjoy I think in America. I think that's overstated. But what Take I, all the credit, no, this, I'll take a little bit of Shaw's credit. But what I will say is this. I no question created wine drinkers in the 20-year-old demo, 21 and older demo, at a time where most people were talking down to people about wine. I was talking with people about wine. Now, I don't want this to become all about wine. This okay. is just how Gary V got into where he is, and he took an idea, which you can apply with almost anything in life, and turn it into something huge. Going back to the days when you were a kid selling, uh, uh, trading baseball cards yes. and selling them, he fe he would go to these trading trade card shows, whatever you call them, yep. where he had lots of competition. A lot of yeah. people had much better cards to sell and trade and make money from, but he just found a different way to do it which made him become the leader as a kid 
in this little bitty industry you knew nothing about, but look what you did. So what did we walk away from that learning and how can we all apply it? For a lot of people that are listening right now, I think one of the, you know, if, it's funny the way you just positioned that. The truth is, I was a DNF student, right? So Martin Luther King School in Edison, New Jersey, North Huntington High School in, in Huntington County. Those teachers, do, they didn't see this coming. And, and so what, what I realized was this is what I was good at, right? I was good at looking at things a little bit different than everybody else. I was good at telling stories. I was good at selling. I was good at really working much harder than anybody else in the things that I was most interested in. And so what I was able to do in a time in the 80s and 90s when it wasn't as cool, right now being an entrepreneur is cool, mm -hmm. right? It's cool. Everybody wants to be a CEO and an entrepreneur. When I was getting D's and F's, I was making $3,000 a weekend as a 14 year old. But my teachers and my friend's parents didn't think I was a winner because the scoring back then was about school. Yeah. And so what the one thing I would take away from this as everybody's listening and driving right now is look, you can decide to choose what the market says is cool now or you could try to figure yourself out and disproportionately triple down on what you're good at. Well, the, the good example here is who do you know other than Gary who was a C D or F student but because they just didn't thrive in a preset like the tests were already written for you, society. Right. But when they came out of that and could make their own rules, come up with their own tests for themselves, they could thrive and fly yeah. like an eagle. And that's the thing. When you we, live by other people's rules, you're not going to give your, uh, yourself a chance to succeed. Take a step back right now and think about who we all admire in the world, right? They're all people that punted the system. They're people that practiced singing since they were five. They're people that shot 10,000 basketballs every morning. It's always that. It's always that. 99% of the people right now that are listening to this are playing in the middle. They're playing in a game that was structured for them. They're risk adverse. They fear. And most importantly, they fear what other people think. Mm -hmm. Elvis, I think the best thing that ever happened to me, much like you with your gold mic, <laughs> I didn't care what other people said. And, and it's not because I didn't respect it. I actually, I get feedback all the time that might be negative, this and that. I respect it. I listen to it. But at the end of the day, I'm just not built to have it dictate my one at bat at life. Okay, have, how do we apply it then? Yeah, have you always been like that or is that just something <sighs> that you had to learn? And I think a little that? bit of both. Look, I got very lucky. I think, you know, not coming for much is a huge advantage. You know, I, I'm writing a book in my head right now that I'll eventually write called I Wish Everybody Was an Immigrant. When you come from nothing, when you come from zero, when you have to walk two miles to Kmart in Dover, New Jersey, um, you know, that's, that's an advantage. Right, so see, no, no, not many people would think that's an advantage. Yeah, until they look around and they look around and realize all these immigrants own all these businesses, <laughs> right? Like, like when you realize how great America really is. You know, right now we're living through such an interesting time, right? And everybody wants to tell you how bad it is, and there's so much. There's always things that are tough. Like, I'm very lucky. I I was born in a different place. I travel a bunch. Like, nobody's moving to Canada or Mexico so quick. Right? right? Nobody's moving somewhere else. This is a special place. And you can e either choose to look at the small percentage of bad things, or you can choose to look at the far majority of amazing things that happen in this country. And that's what I choose to do. And I think once people realize all the opportunity and realize, first and foremost, Elvis, nobody's going to care about your complaining. Like, I love when people complain. Like, who, who's going to care? And so how do you apply it? It's a mindset. Right? Have I always had it? Look, I had the benefit of having a mother who's the greatest in the world that instilled so much self-esteem in me that peer pressure and negativity never even got close to the center of my soul, right? I got lucky that way. But you I, found yourself. I found myself. I think, you know, it's funny, and I remember it. It was like fourth grade. I got an F on a science test, and for some unknown reason, I mean, remember, you're really young at fourth grade. For some weird reason, I was like... I just don't care about Saturn, and I have a funny feeling it's not going to matter to me. Wow, there you go. Wow. What about Uranus? <laughs> yeah, I care about Uranus. All right, thank you. <laughs> By the way, if you, that was if you, set up so perfect. Okay, look. Uh, okay, I'm almost caffeinated up to Gary V's uh, <laughs> level. Uh, Gary, uh, Gary V is here. Gary Vaynerchuk, of course. Uh, the CEO of, of the world, you know, <laughs> but uh, we're about to get into the meat and potatoes okay. of how this can work for everyone. I love it. First of all. I am sick and effing tired of people calling millennials lazy and not caring and not, not wanting to contribute. And I'm tired of it because I don't believe it. I think everyone has an equal opportunity to be lazy or 
dynamic. You're preaching. I mean, I get this all the time because I have such a big fan base of 40, 50, 60 year old executives and they're like, how do you deal with these millennials? And I'm like, look, there's Stop no, calling them millennials, first of no all. There's no millennials. There's Rick. There's Susan. Exactly. There's Sarah, right? I know unlimited 40 to 50 year olds that are lazy and, and have no drive and I have tons of 23 year olds that work at VaynerMedia that if I give them $1 more an hour, they'll work 72 hours in a 24 hour day. Talk about it then. 20, I'm 22 years old. I'm yep. paying off... Uh, my, my debt from, from college. We should get into that racket to begin so with. So if, if I'm 22 years old, I've got the whole world ahead of me. I've got more opportunity than most people. So why I am I branded a loser? Well, because old people want to complain about the next generation. We become bitter. So but don't listen bitter. to them. Of, of course not. So 22-year-old, let's say I'm 22. Tell me what I need to be doing right now to make my Every dreams come Every 22 true. to 30-year-old that's listening to this right now, you have one major flaw I'm generalizing. You have a lack of patience. Elvis, if you really want to talk about it, what people are making is they've got college debts, they've got their ambitions, one of the two. Let's say it's a positive, let's say it's a negative. And they pop out at 22, 23, and they take jobs that pay them $4,000 more for something they don't want to do because they lack patience. Wow. Mm. Uh-huh. That's the punchline, my friend. Like, if you- like, Do what you can want I, can I, to can do. I, how old are you? 52 almost. Are you blown away as I am as a 40-year-old man how young you feel? Oh, yeah. If, if I told 25-year-old Elvis at 52 you would feel like this? No, I feel better. No, no, these are the days. Winston Churchill, my favorite, my favorite quote, these are the days. And that's the punchline. If, if I could wish anything right now, I, could, I would wish that everybody who's listening that's under 30 could feel what you and I feel right now. I mean, I don't even feel like I've started. Mm-hmm. You know, and so when you're 22, I remember being 22. It wasn't that that long ago. 40s old. I would have been like, oof. Like that would have, like in that 18 years, I better have, if I'm going to buy the New York Jets like I want to, I better have done it there. Now I realize, my God, life is so long. And the way we're taking care of ourselves, you know, your, your, your parents, my parents at, at our ages, they were not as healthy. They were, they, you know, we're going to live much longer. We're going to live into our 90s, hundreds, like, we have so oh, much no, time. I'm going to go beyond that. Okay, respect. <laughs> so so the punchline, the punchline, in? in one way or the other, I would ask everybody who's listening right now to take one step back and say, okay, either I'm working too hard and I'm stressing these loans or what I have to achieve to prove to my dad that I'm good, right? And I'm not going to Coachella or this or that. Or you're doing too much of that stuff and you can work a little harder, but you've got so much more time. And so I think the one thing, and it was funny, was that awkward pause that we all just took. Patience is something we do not talk about. Well, and it's something that it doesn't seem to be valued right now because if you notice, like I remember this is years ago, but back when Oprah was on and had her show every day, she did so many episodes about young kids who are geniuses or young kids who are 10 and already graduated college. And so in our society, we're being told that the faster you do something, the better you are, the more it's valuable you are. why listening to are. society is a bad idea. If you listen to society, the world's on fire and we're all going to die. If you listen to society, everybody's going to build Facebook and Snapchat. Then who do we listen to? Our, ourselves? Listen to yourself. Now, the problem is a lot of us don't like what ourselves are telling right, to the inner voice can The inner voice can uh -huh. be our worst enemy. That's right. So, so... First and foremost, what, what I think everybody should do, and even I'm, I'm saying this, actually I'm giving myself advice right now, I'm just getting meta and stepping away from this interview. You need to do things that make you a little uncomfortable. Way too many people have made decisions without ever trying. Right? So that, that's one thing that I so think. So like it's too scary. I don't want to do it. I'm that's not right. Do it. And you have to taste things. Like I love when people are like, oh, I hate sushi. I'm like, have you had it? Right. Like, no. That's me. <laughs> that's her. Right. Like, I don't like, want to taste it. Right. And so, and so to me, that's the most fascinating thing of how humans are. Right? Like that's what we do. And so the punchline is this. Look, here's what, I, here's what I'll say on this little genre as we're jamming on it. You have one life. Like, one of the great things that happened to me growing up was there was a lot of grandparents that visited. I had a lot of kids in my neighborhood. And for some unknown reason, I don't know if I'm an old soul or what it is, I used to, on the playground, go and sit with old people yeah. and just talk to them. And let me tell you one thing about old people, 80, 90. The one thing that has stuck with me as a child and sits with me today is they regret. Mm. Regret scares the crap out of me, Elvis. Do you have any regret right now? 
No, but I also am 40, so I feel like I can get a lot thing of things done. I feel like a lot of things are still in front of me. But when you get to 80 and 90 and you can't do everything and you know that you don't have as much time, well, the one thing I see in so many of their eyes is I wish I. And, the, and they I give us I. these lists. They give us the gift of these lists all the time. Like you'll, you'll have a healthcare worker who works with people who are on their deathbed. They'll ask them, give us the top five things you regret from life. They tell us what they regret and we still don't listen. Did you see that article with the hospice? Yeah, yeah. You saw Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. It, it really is fascinating. We're going to get at, into that in a moment. Okay. But uh, Gary Vee is here. Uh, we're just getting started. We're just revving these engines up. <laughs> uh, I want to I I talk to you about the dream everyone has of not working for the man and doing it for themselves and how they can use where they are now to catapult them into where they want to go. Because I was talking thoughts. to Danielle about this in a few yeah. a few seconds ago. Gary Vee's here. We'll be back with him with more right after this. What's hot? Gary Vaynerchuk is here. Gary V, we call him. Make sure you're following him everywhere you can because every day he gives us some thoughts that really, really catapult us into the day. And books, yeah, he's got books. He's got everything. You don't want to be known as a motivational speaker. You're more of a... Listen, I've built a $50 million business and a $100 million business. And I think a lot of people, when they hear motivational speakers and things of that nature... It creeps us out. It creeps me out. I mean, somebody who's... I love practicality. Look, I'm very motivating. I, I understand that. You know, mom and dad had sex at the right moment and gave me that DNA. I right. get that. But I like that I didn't start telling the world, you can do it until I did it. Right. Instead of what we see on Instagram, which is 22-year-old life coaches trying to tell us what to do. It's kind of weird because usually when guests are here... They have a, a laundry list of things they want to promote. Yeah. We were asking Gary earlier what he wanted to promote today. He's like, oh, I'm not here to promote anything. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I'm like, let's get to callers. Let's talk to callers. <laughs> well, okay. He's helping people. Okay, so we're going to talk to Anne-Marie in one second. But earlier you, you gave us great advice. We need to be more patient in, in order to tackle life and win. What do you mean by patience? We need to be patient with what? Life, like, you know, everybody wants this car. Everybody wants, everybody wants to achieve. Everybody wants these things. First of all, we should want less things. I think that, if, if, by the way, you want to stereotype in the other direction, everybody? I think millennials are the greatest generation of not wanting big TVs and watches and fast cars. They, they want to go and experience things. They want to live a li little bit of a better lifestyle. It, it comes down to this, Elvis. I think you have to work hard. Like, just so everybody knows, we haven't gotten into this subject yet. Working hard is the cost of entry to anything. You know zero people that are successful that don't work their face off. You know zero people. Now, they may have money because mommy and daddy made money and gave it to them. But people that actually built their own success, you know zero people that have had success that did not put in obnoxious amounts of work. Very good. Yeah. We're about to talk to someone about that in just a second. Okay. But dad always said... I'm thinking of these great pieces of advice from my, my, my father who's passed away. You can't have it all. Where would you put it? <laughs> it's like, where are you going to put it? By the way, real quick, I know we're going to the call, but I yes. want to say this. Something back to Shah, we talked about him. When I was on his show, I talked about selling stuff in your house on eBay. I've gotten 50 to 100 emails in the last 30 to 60 days of people auditing their home, selling everything they didn't want on eBay, and people literally making a thousand, three thousand, ten thousand dollars to take a vacation on literally just stuff, like, stuff. like an owl lamp. No, <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Oh, back sorry. off. Oh, back sorry. away from the owl oh, lamp. No. Who do you think you are? That's part of the family, Gary. Everything was going so Don't well. Don't mess with my owl lamp. Believe me. Uh, we'll get rid of everyone here before the owl lamp <laughs> got goes. It, got it. All right, let's get Anna Marie. I can't believe you're making fun of my, my owl lamp. Anna Marie, say good morning to Gary V. What's on your mind today, Anna Marie? Good morning, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. Well, I have a question for you. Okay. So I started my own business um, just about two years ago, essentially the same day that I signed divorce papers. I signed a lease to my retail store, and I did it with pretty limited funds, mm -hmm. and I've been very, very fortunate. I put in my 18-hour days. I love, love every it. minute of it, and a big tool for me has been social media, using Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of that, and so I'm wondering in your mind where you feel the next step is once you've, not exhausted because that's continuous, but once you've sort of plateaued. What kind of store do you have? I own a chocolate pretzel company. I've actually had the pleasure of meeting Danielle. Oh, oh my gosh, her pretzels are amazing. <laughs> well, look, you just oh. took the first step. You're getting advertisement on one of the biggest oh, shows in America. So yeah, good. well, I've been listening to you for quite a while. Emery, I think first and 
well, you, you really saved yourself because I was going to razz you, but you did a great job. I think Facebook ad, I don't think your pretzel shop will ever spend enough time and money on Facebook ads. And right. so I want to give you really good advice because I want you to email me in a year and say, Gary, you did it. Mm -hmm. Spend an obnoxious amount of time on Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. Run a lot of ads within a one mile radius of your actual store. I'm sure you're doing online business. Oh, yes. Uh, I, are you running Facebook ads or are you spending money on Facebook I ads? I have not done ads yet. Everything, you know, I've been very fortunate. Uh, my business has strictly been word of mouth. I actually don't do any advertising or marketing only on social media. Spend and money we, on Facebook ads because here's my punchline. As fortunate and as amazing as you've been, right. you can be bigger and better. Absolutely. And That's so the plan. <laughs> I would deploy a certain percentage of your profits to Facebook ads. They mm -hmm. will work. And, and also, they're, they're, they're yeah. actually, actually very economical. Facebook, Facebook ads. Facebook advertising yes, is the number, for everybody who's listening right now, Facebook advertising is the number one deal in marketing, period, in the world. Not in social right. media, not in digital, in the whole game. Wow. Right. right. And, you, and you got to celebrate something, Emery, before we let you go. The yes. day you signed your divorce papers and you opened your business and signed that lease, the most important day of your life. Yeah. Love that. Emery, you know, thanks for listening to it. Send those pretzels. Yeah. <laughs> and send her some friggin' pretzels. Hey, uh, before we take another call, yeah. my takeaway today that just makes my nipples so hard about what Gary Vee said earlier. Yes, look, I could cut glass with them. Look. They are very hard. <laughs> Holy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for whatever reason, the happy people on earth are the most silent. Yes. Therefore, we only hear from the loud, unhappy people. And it's doing something that's awful to us in our, in our lives. Talk about that. I'm upset. And how do we fix it? We fix it by going on one of the biggest radio shows in the country and challenging everybody who's listening right now that if you're in a good mood, that's something smart to tweet about too. Mm. Like, why have we defaulted only to producing conversation around negativity. Because let me tell everybody who's listening right now what happens. People start believing that's what's actually happening. And so every day, every day, 99% of this audience has good moments, but they never think about sharing that on Facebook. Yet, the second somebody cuts them off on the road, or the cashier is slow, or they don't like something that's happening in politics, they get nasty. It's rubbernecking. And we have to start talking positive because <laughs> this is our lives and we're, we're going down a slippery slope. And so I think positivity needs a momentum booster. Let me ask you this, Gary. In yes. your opinion, are there more people who are happy or more people who are miserable in life right now? You know what the best part is? I'm not even going to use my opinion. The data shows that more people are happy. Do you know how amazing the world is? Crime is down. Uh, you know, every, the media wants to tell you it's not, right? Like, so many things are in great places right now. Now, somebody's listening saying, easy for you. That's fine, but you have to understand, you live in a country that allows you the chance to get out of that. Like, the market doesn't care if you're poor, you're black, you're white, you're a girl. Like, if those pretzels are delicious, they don't care if an alien made it. <laughs> and that's what's great about the market. The market doesn't care one way or another, which means you have a shot. Your parents may be judging you. Your wife may say you're a loser. Your neighborhood might say you suck. But the market that gets you out of your situation, it's actually not judging you. And that is why this is the greatest time to be alive. Is that why our show does fairly well? If I can just toot our own, our own horn for a second. We are probably one of the only places to go where we are amplifying happy and positive thinking than... Everywhere else. And Have you ever on, heard of Oprah? Yeah. Like, she did okay. No. Who's that? But even on, <laughs> <laughs> even I love on Oprah. days when crap is going on in the world, which is so often now, we'll come in and say, look, we know a lot of crap is going on. We need to give you some positivity. Let me give you when you crap know? was really going on. When our grandparents were alive. Mm. There's been, this isn't crap. This is not crap, guys. We have it so good. Like, like everyone's, everyone thinks it's so bad. Like, Americans lived in fear that Russia was going to bomb us every day from 1950 to 1980. Like, this is not crap. They're not about to bomb us? Well, actually, <laughs> Putin's a character. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's true. You know what? And yeah. this is why it's so important to study history. People wonder why history is such an important thing to study. It is because you need to see where we've been and how we've got to where yeah. we are. Uh, let's go talk to Steven. Steven, say hi to Gary V. What's up? Hey, Gary. Hey, everybody. Hi, hey, Steven. Morning. How's it going? So just a quick question for you. I mean, I consider myself an extremely ambitious person and 
you know, I have all these ideas, but when it comes down to, you know, you see a lot of people, they have connections and they have startup dollars and, you know, some people just don't have those kinds of resources. So as somebody who is an ambitious person and wants to go, you know, create something, you know, how do you even get started? How do yeah, you start what, is, what does Stephen do? How old are you? I'm 28. See, this is a perfect, you know, this question would have never been asked 10 years ago because of startup culture, and and I'm not blaming you, this is for everybody who's listening, everybody thinks you need startup capital, right? Like, where's my angel investor? I don't know any rich friends. Steven, I'll be very honest with you. If you're so ambitious, why don't you go out and sell stuff on the side, get a second or third job, sell stuff on eBay. Like, you can easily figure out a way to muster up an extra five, 10, 15, 20, 30,000 dollars by hustling extra. I, I think if you don't have connections, that's your only alternative, right? Like, if you do have connections, great. But to really answer your question, I think a lot of people want to start this app and they have this big idea, but they, what they don't realize is they should go and do something completely different to muster up the dollars or back to patients, get two jobs, eat crow, stop watching you know, Game of Thrones, don't play Pokemon Go, go all in for three years and do nothing. Listen, Steven, I did not have, I did not have my 20s at all. All my friends now show up on Facebook and they're like, Gary, you're so lucky, you're so lucky. And I reply to all of them. I'm like, I'm lucky? Let me remind you something. Remember 1999 to 2009 when you went to the Jersey Shore every weekend and hooked up with chicks? I worked. So my answer to Steven and everybody else is, if you're so ambitious, show me. Right, right. I mean, I get the hustle I am in sales right now, and it's just uh, when you when you have a full time job as well, it's 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 difficult. So no, it's not. Let me, let me see. And saying. I'm not trying to bust you. Here's my real question: If you really want it, and by the way, you get to choose your work life balance. But you know, that's right. on you. Like that's not me to choose or anybody else. What I'm passionate about, Stephen, to be very frank with you, is what did you do from Friday 5 p.m. until Monday 7 a.m.? I'm just curious. Like, and I don't think you shouldn't have a weekend, but I think everybody's ambition actually is more predicated on their actions than their words. My friends tell me all the time they're so ambitious, and I'm like, if that's true, then you punt leisure, and you punt concerts at Jones Beach, and you work. Wow. Stephen, right. best of luck right. to you. Thank Thanks you for listening to us. Yeah, sometimes these pills are hard to swallow. And listen, and I think Stephen's a great guy, and, and I didn't want to. I, I used Stephen as a catalyst for a lot of people that are listening. I don't know Stephen's situation. You dashed his hopes but, and dreams. No, I, I, Elvis, I think a lot of people say that. I, I, I never say. I don't want to say that I'm ambitious. I want to show you that I'm ambitious. Go watch my Snapchat, Gary V E E. Go watch my Snapchat. And see that I'm up at 5.37 in the morning and see that I'm in meetings at 11.58 p.m. There's no question to Garrett if I'm, if I'm ambitious. I'm showing you. And so I just think we live in, by the way, I think it's so good in America that most people are soft. People Talk like about to, it. Easy. People like to say they're ambitious, but look what they do. They say, they look at the negative. Hey, I don't have connections like some other gir guy or girl I heard of that got $50,000 from people to start their startup. Woe is me. Woe is me. There's never been a generation. Our parents, our grandparents, they never heard of startup capital. They worked two jobs, saved money for seven years, then took the money they saved and risked it and built a business. GoFundMe was not around. There was no Go. I'm going to start. What do you a think about GoFundMe? And everything's going to be okay. It's so what crazy. do you think? You, you don't it's like GoFundMe? No, I love it. I just also know the data shows that 99 percent of the people don't get their money. Again, it's like I think a screwdriver works, but if you don't know how to use it, got it? GoFundMe is a great tool. But do you have such a great idea that America is going to be excited to write you a check so that you can do it? So, <laughs> I wish we had like another five hours. I, yeah, I when can, can come you back. come back? Tomorrow's good. <laughs> 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 Is this Ta over? Ta no, no, yeah, almost. I, I, I hate that. I know, I hate so that. Upset. But no, 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 do me a favor. I feel like we're just getting the East Coast hustlers going. I, I feel, I know. I feel, I feel like, like people are like sitting at their desk right now and saying, yeah. I know. <laughs> it's like foreplay with Gary Vee. <laughs> yeah. Then we got to like, oh, sorry, I got to go. Do something else. <laughs> do me a favor, though. Before you leave, we're running a little late, but I want you to do something. I think it's very important. Uh, Danielle's husband, Sheldon, was saying you got to tell the Jersey story about uh, oh. giving the Jersey to yeah. 
This is actually a very long story. We don't have a lot of time. Here's the punchline, guys. If you're running a business, actually for the pretzel gal and everybody else, um, and Marie, and everybody else who's listening who has a business, Twitter, twitter.com slash search. Tell your story. Take your time on it. Okay. I want to hear the story. I wrote a book several years ago called The Thank You Economy. I've been on this kick for a long time that positivity rules, that that's really where the action is. And I wanted to send somebody a gift as a thank you for buying wine from Mm winelibrary.com. So somebody places an order and we find their name and we find their Twitter account. When we look at their Twitter account, and this is what everybody can do, you can go look up people's names, find their Twitter account, and then look at it. And then we looked at their tweets. We saw this guy loved the Chicago Bears. And he kept talking about the Bears quarterback, Jay Cutler. Just kept talking about it, talking about it. So the guy placed a $100 order that we made $13 profit on. But I told my team to send him a $400 signed Jay Cutler jersey from eBay, send it to him and say, thank you for being a Wine Library customer, right? So the punchline was he was going to write back and, and, you know, tell us that he'll buy all his wine from us for the rest of his life. That was my plan. Here's what happens next. For three weeks, we don't hear a thing. So I call my team. I'm like, have we heard anything? They go, no. I'm like, son of a gun. It's not this guy got damn jersey. Where the hell is he, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, super upset. Da, yeah. da, 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 da. All of a sudden, I give up on it. I'm boarding a plane. I get a call from Wine Library, and they go, you've got to see this. And I'm like, what happened? I'm like, the guy? They're like, no. I'm like, damn. He goes, Better. They read an order that came in for thousands of dollars of red burgundy. And in the notes section, it says, hey, Wine Library, this is my first order. Just found out about you. First of all, you have unbelievable prices on red burgundy. Second of all, I live in Texas. It's hot. Please ship this order after the summer. P.S. I found out about you because you sent my friend Steve a Bears jersey. And that's how I became aware of your business. P.S.S. I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. <laughs> <laughs> the punchline is this of that story. Wine Library, myself, if you go look at my account, we give away stuff all the time, surprise and delight, find out what people care about. A lot of times they don't write back. I'm not telling you the story about when I bought the guy a PS3 and five games that I never heard a peep from him, right? But when you do the right thing, the right things happen. Everybody wants to do something and expect something in return. I'm not interested in coming here and promoting stuff. I don't need to do that. I needed to come here and try to give advice that 100 people, 1,000 people that are listening right now got value out of. And then that's going to work itself out for me one day. Doing the right thing is always the right thing. And you can do that in business and you can do that in life. And God bless your parents for wow. instilling that into you because obviously. No question. I obviously. give them absolute, the circumstances of being an immigrant and my parents are the reason I'm here. This is exactly what my husband does and it's because of you. Like Thanksgiving, he gives all his clients pies for Thanksgiving. They get to pick a pie and he has this great pie giveaway. But he does these things. And do you know what happens? Yeah. Friends go to friends' That's homes. That's it. Mm-hmm. They're, right. like, they're like, you'll never believe who gave me this great rhubarb pie. Yeah. Excellent. Gary V. Got to follow him today. Do whatever you can. Gary V. E. E. Gary V. E. E. Follow him. Very important. Thanks for coming in, Gary. We'll be right back. 